What do I need to be good at to be great at something? Hello, everyone. You are listening to She Leads with Carly. And in this show, we talk to the absolute best, brightest, and yes, badass leaders. Tap into where your natural curiosity takes you. Just making sure you're not your own roadblock. Even if you do fall, you're going to fall and you're going to learn. Together, let's build a DNA of what it takes to rise to the top and truly make an impact. I'm your host, Carly Malatsky. Hi, everyone. You're listening to She Leads with Carly. Our guest today is Angie Bastian, the founder of Angie's Boom Chicka Pop. So while you may not know who Angie is, I can guarantee you've had the famous Boom Chicka Pop popcorn. If not, then honestly, I'm not sure what you're snacking on, but please go try it out. Anyway, we have an amazing chat about how she started Angie's Boom Chicka Pop with her husband. For them, it was honestly just about how to make money for their kids' college fund. Clearly, it turned out into something much, much more. So please take a listen and enjoy. Hello, Angie. I am so excited to have you on She Leads today. Thank you so much for joining. I really am so excited. Thank you for having me, Carly. Of course. So Angie, you are the founder of Angie's Boom Chicka Pop, as you can see in the background, which is an international snack brand that's really worth hundreds of millions of dollars and most well known for its popcorn, which is, by the way, I have it as well and it's delicious. So Angie, we'll get into that. It was founded in 2001 with your husband, Dan, you and your husband. But what Mm -hmm. I love to do is take me back to when you were in college, you went to Goshen College and you got a degree in nursing and you ended up getting a master's in nursing from Emory a few years later. But from my understanding, you didn't even know that college was in the picture. So take me to this whole process, like why nursing and yeah, kind of this whole, this time in your life, navigating your, your future. Um, well, thanks for, uh, I rarely go back that far, but we're happy to go back that far. Um, I, I grew up in a small community and on a small Mennonite farm. My grandparents were Amish. My, my mom and dad, um, were Mennonite and we lived in the back of my grandparents' farm for a while and um, in a trailer. And so my beginnings were very humble. Um, And, uh, you know, my parents were married when they were 18 and 19 and had me when they were, you know, when my mom was 19 and my dad was 20. And, um, you know, they, my, they, my dad went to two year business school and, you know, developed a career in business. And my mom kind of worked in, I don't know, uh, different places. And, and, you know, we had a small farm and, um, you know, I, 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 nobody in my family, in my immediate family ever really talked about college. You know, they never said, or set that expectation, like that I should go to college. And I loved school. Um, I loved to go to school and I loved everything about school. I know I was a complete nerd in that way. Um, And I never understood why kids didn't want to go to school. (laughs) I, that was not me. And, um, and so, but when, but when, um, high school was done, I went to work for my dad. My dad had a small business and I became his sort of office manager. I I did inventory. I did, I I typed for him. I, you know, I did all the secretarial stuff. I, I ran and got parts, everything. And, um, and during that time, um, I went to visit my aunt and uncle that lived in Colorado. And my aunt was a was a nurse and my uncle was a school teacher would be my dad's brother and they looked at me and they said why aren't you in college you know and I was like well, I don't know you know you, do you think I could do it and and she goes of course you can you know of course you can do it and um I was like oh okay somebody thinks I can do it you know um and all, that's all I needed you know and and I just then it was like what do I want to do and I didn't really know um 
but I just enrolled in what I did know, which was Goshen College, and that was close to my home. It was a Mennonite liberal arts college, and, um, you know, it, it had a, a nursing program that was, you know, 100% pass rate <laughs> on the boards, and, you know, it was it was really a good program. And, and, uh, I said, well, I'll just sign up for nursing. That's what my aunt did. And maybe I'll do it. I never really wanted to be a nurse. Yeah. Well, you know, like some, some people know when they're little, what they want to be. I, it was never me. Yeah. Um, but I, I did it and I had a lot of good friends that were nurses and, and actually loved it. And you, that is so that's, that's such a cool, like even such a cool <laughs> story. And, and just the fact that you needed that one person to tell you, you know what, you can go to college and you needed that one voice in your head and be like, why not? Like I can. And so it's very interesting. It's so cool. I love it. Well, Carly, I think what that taught me and what I remember about this is kids as smart as they can be. And I know I'm, I'm pretty, so I'm above average. I'm not brilliant, pretty sure, but above average. And, um, and what they need is somebody because they don't think about things in the way you know, if they don't know, right? So they sometimes just need somebody to say something to them, like like they can imagine um, that they would be in college. And, and that kind of validation or narration of what could be or what's possible, kids can't think that way. I mean, they're really fairly concrete in their thinking. And even me, I, I mean, I graduated a year early and I was only 17, but I still wasn't able to think about, you know, like, oh, you know, my future could be different than what it is in the present, you know? Yeah, exactly. So I think it's really important for, for adults to, to narrate the possibilities for their, for kids. Yes, I agree. Even, even planting that seed, that little seed yes. is enough for it to grow. And then I, I totally agree. So yeah, yeah. coming out of college, you're a nurse practitioner at this moment. So walk me through this moment where I assume you, you meet Dan and you guys, yeah. you know, start, start dating, getting married. At this moment, when did you have a passion for nursing? Did you did you envision yourself being a nurse for the rest of your life, or what did you kind of view a future versus in the moment? Like, how did you balance a future versus right now? Yeah, well, and I would say I came out of undergrad uh, as a nurse, went straight into ICU and went into ERs and worked there and worked with handicapped kids and for six years, and then did like worked in open heart recovery. And I just kept trying to grow and learn and experiment with different. That's what's really beautiful, sort of about nursing, is you could do all different kinds of things within the profession. And and then I I kind of built enough confidence in myself that I was like, well, I could probably do grad school. I'm going to go to grad school mm -hmm. and become a, a, a nurse practitioner. And, and at the time I had worked with a lot of patients that had, were recovering from heart, you know, heart surgery or, or a heart attack. And a lot of them were depressed. And so I got interested in why that happened and what was going on. And so what I thought is I'd go back to grad school in mental health or psychiatric nursing. And, but I hadn't really understood that to be a separate um, specialty. And it really wasn't at the time. It was just, you could be a therapist sort of nurse, uh, but not a nurse practitioner that was, you know, doing clinical, specific clinical and diagnostic mm. in, um, work. And I really wanted to do that. And so, because I didn't think I'd be a very good therapist because I don't sit still for very long <laughs> and I want to tell people what to do, you know, and therapists don't do that. Mm. So, um, you know, coming out of grad school, I was interested in, um, multicultural health care. And I got my, my psychiatric nursing degree with, with a gerontology um, co-degree yeah. and sat for my boards and, and decided to go to New Mexico. And I went to New Mexico and worked um, in a private hospital that had the contract for Indian Health Service and the Navajo tribe and the Zuni tribe. And, um, and that's and um, that's where I met my husband. He was teaching school um, in Gallup, New Mexico at the high school, Gallup coaching baseball. And I was working in the hospital and his, he was living with his uncle and he was from, New, uh, from Minnesota and his uncle was the CFO of the hospital. And there were just a bunch of random people out there yeah. working in the, in the systems in uh, Gallup, New Mexico. Yeah. And um, we just kind of hung out and that's where we met. And then, so... You and so Dan's a teacher, you are a nurse yep. practitioner. And then yep. from so listening to other podcasts with you, tell me now, founding Angie's Boom Chicka Pop, 
Okay. Mind, so tell me about how it was more so just thinking about your future for your kids and really like, okay, we need, yeah. to, we need to start planning. So yeah. yeah, tell me that story. Then. Well, we, we had two kids in New Mexico and okay. then, um, you know, little kids and you're scrambling to, you know, be a good parent and you're scrambling to, to make your career grow. And, um, we eventually moved back. We first moved to my home, which was Sarasota, Florida for three years to be close to my family. And then we decided to move to Minnesota and, uh, where Dan's hometown is. And that's Mankato. And, um, when we got there, it was like, we were both just restless and we just, we, our children were three in size at the time. And we just said, you know, uh, let's start something, you know, let's do something. We need to like get going on a college fund for these kids because education was so important to me and so important to Dan. And, um, and so, you know, we hadn't started yet. So we just bought this kettle, um, and this tent and and we used a credit card to pay for it. And we start, and we were like, well, this should be, we could do this on the weekends and in the evenings and, you know, at fairs and festivals and streets street carnivals and farmers markets and we can bring the kids along and we can teach them how to make change and work alongside of us and it'll be fun right like so that's how it started in the fall of 2001 and you know we we started popping kettle corn at like in front of grocery stores and on street corners yeah and a baseball how it started. games and everything. Ba- right. Yeah. Baseball games, Minnesota Vikings, football games, you know, Incredible. stuff like that. So, Anywhere anyone would let us pop. So in these, and so first, when did you guys realize like, okay, this is actually something, this is actually something like we should, we can quit our job and we can devote our lives to this now. Um, well, we did that sort of incrementally. Okay. Um, yeah. We did that when we got an opportunity to sell in a local grocery store chain in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, And that's when Dan, we, Dan and I talked about it and we just decided he's, you know, my job can probably support the family um, and he can maybe quit teaching and go full force with the business. And uh, so we, we, you know, we were for three years sort of concessionaires, you know, going around and uh, we were licensed as a mobile food unit. And then in 2004, you know, we found a commercial kitchen, we bought some indoor equipment and he started full time. And then we started building the business. Um, I kept working as a nurse and doing sort of the books on the side and doing the marketing piece. And he started building the operations and, and did most of the sales, you know, and meeting with people. And, um, it wasn't until 2011 when we took private equity money, uh, that, um, they, you know, they said, you know, we're investing in you and Dan. And so we kind of expect you to be there full time too, um, and I had really worked my my nursing time down to just a, a day or two a week. And, and that's the moment I was like, well, okay. I had 28 years of nursing. I thought that was a pretty good career. And I'd be willing to try something new yeah. and, and learn as fast as I could how to be a, a business leader instead of a healthcare leader. Amazing. So, so first, a lot of people have these ideas, but there's a difference between having an idea and then actually getting started. And so I think I want to know any advice you have for people who have these ideas, but almost like, okay, let me see if there's, if there's something there, like you guys bought the kettle core machine or you bought that machine and you tested it and you iterated and tried seeing where it could stick. So what advice do you have for people to like actually get started and and going and testing? Well, you know, since, like I, I didn't know how to write a business plan. Neither did Dan. Right? Yeah. Like we had no idea. Um, we just jumped way ahead of ourselves, you know. And I, what I've seen in retrospect, as I've mentored a lot of, you know, um, entrepreneurs with great ideas, is that they, they pause in the beginning, maybe a little too long to just get this idea perfect and the business plan perfect and everything covered, you know, um, and, and all their projections just right, you know, um, and, and they haven't sold a single thing yet and they haven't tested it and they haven't done anything, but they have this, they have a perfect business plan, you know, a perfect business yeah. plan that's going to change tomorrow. I'll just tell you that. So um, I would just say, 
you know, move faster, like move faster from idea to execution to test the market, to see if the product is actually relevant, to see if you actually like doing what, what this is or, 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 if, or if consumers have feedback for you because yeah. they, I guarantee you, they will have feedback. You can think you have the most perfect product and they will tell you why it's not perfect, you know? And then you need time to like figure out how to, to create something that people want. And you may, you may think it's, you may, you may be ahead of, you may be ahead of the consumer market. You may be behind if you, if you haven't been watching trends carefully enough and you're not going to know that until you get out there and start trying. Yeah. And you guys, you and Dan are both the epitome of the idea that entrepreneurship can really be learned. You don't have to, yes. you don't have to study it. You don't have to learn about it really to dive into it. And so do you think, like talk a little bit about that, but also do you think that that kind of gave you an advantage not knowing and really just like diving in and going with instinct maybe over, over like what the books say? Well, and I, I wouldn't know what the books say, right? Like, so I don't, they're, the books are probably right about a lot of things. Yeah. We just didn't know what we were wrong about. And we made a lot of mistakes that were probably expensive mistakes that a lot of people could avoid if they, you know, if they, if they had, you know, foundational information that we didn't have. Um, but we didn't let that stop us. And I think, um, you know, just just, I think everybody needs to be aware that the odds are against you, you know, no matter what. And so you just have to reconcile with that and say, you know, the perseverance, yeah. the, um, the grit, the fortitude, the decision that you, that you make, whether you're um, a learned entrepreneur or you're learning by experience, yeah. it, it is, it is the, it is the, the perseverance that will get you through. I mean, the learning in itself is helpful, but it takes, it takes some grit to make it happen. And, and that's where I think that's where maybe, you know, we had enough of that to get us through. Yeah. You know? Do you think that grit, cause I think common along, common among a lot of entrepreneurs is that grit. Cause as you said, it's yeah, not easy. Right. There are bumps in the road, there no. are challenges and it's really about, persevering how did you how did you do you have any tips to be perser like to persevere a lot and have that grit is that something that you could practice and learn or is this something that really you have within you no I think it's absolutely learned and I would say um I would call it I use my nursing brain because when I and uh, honestly you know um as a nurse you sometimes like I would work for 12 hours our shift and not pee, not once, yeah. you know, <laughs> because it was too busy. And I would, I just didn't even have to, I didn't even think about it until yeah. I was done. I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't go to the bathroom the whole 12 hours. So, I mean, it, that is, that's a, that's a, I, that may be sort of a crude way of um, explaining uh, perseverance. It, but what it is, is it's about, um, you know, sort of self-sacrificing yeah. for the for the goal or the good of of a of something else. And mm -hmm. so, um, if you're if you don't believe your business is worth doing, you're probably not going to sacrifice some of those things that those things that maybe when it gets really hard yeah. to do. So it is, it's really important that you have some agreement. And I think for Dan and I as partners, you know, in this thing together, we sort of had agreement uh, that this was pretty important for us to continue to do. But some days he would be like, I'm ready to give up. And on other days I would be like, why are we doing this? And I think that's why it was helpful to have each other because yeah. on those days when I was ready to give up, he'd go, I got this, you know, I'll take over. And we had some role flexibility, or I would say he would just be spent. Like he was like fried and had a migraine and I would say, I'll, okay, I've got this, like, I've got this phone call. I'll do this meeting, you know? So we, we had this flexibility and, and, and a, a little, our own little team partnership that we then grew. And that's, that's another thing I think entrepreneurs sometimes get um, they hold, get wrong. They hold onto things way too tight because that's the only way they, they want it done the way they want to do it. And they think they're the only ones that can do it. And, and I think when you're moving from, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're, you're the janitor and you're the CEO at the same time. And if you can't let go of, you know, a couple of those tasks and teach someone else how you want it to be done, 
you're you're going to stifle your organization. You're going to stifle yourself. And so, entrepreneurship, I believe, is is a series of letting go. It's knowing everything and then giving, handing it off, and trusting that you have brought the right people on to help you, and that you ha- trust the people that you've brought on to help you, and you trust your partnerships, and you trust people to be good and to do what they need to do. And that's what I think makes a successful organization. Yeah. Wow, Angie, I I love that. I think that you you gave so many lessons in that answer, even starting with perseverance and almost recognizing that you're creating something bigger than yourself and like what you're creating can impact hundreds. So like that should be getting you through it. And, and then obviously like hiring and the ability to let go. I think that's, I think that's very, very important. And I, um, I could see that standing in the way for sure. Well, and it's, and, and letting go is not letting go of perseverance. It's, right, it, no, yeah. it is just a different way. I mean, I, I do think entrepreneurs feel sometimes like they have to do it themselves yeah. and that's what perseverance is, but I don't think that's what perseverance is. Yeah, no, it's completely two separate things. Do you have advice in terms of like, did you struggle to let go and give, give the reins off to someone else to do things where... And yeah, it's hard. Yeah, because you want them to do it the way you want it done, right? Yeah. Like it, it's it, you, you're so identified with your company or your your product and what you've created, and so I think you know we had a fairly long trajectory. It was 16 years, and so we had time to yeah. let go in incremental pieces. You know, Amazing. so so Angie, I want you to discuss. So obviously, she leads is all about the female leader, and so mm-hmm. I want to know. As a female founder, you're you're with your husband, you founded with your husband, but I want to know in those early stages, was there ever a, you know, feeling like, okay, I'm the female founder and maybe when, like, for instance, getting funding by, by VC firms or whatnot, did you ever feel like, okay, Dan, you take this over because I'm a female, maybe, maybe they'll respect you more, or do you ever come across these like dichotomies and how you dealt with it? It's a reality of, of, um, female-led businesses, that they don't get the same amount and level of funding that male-led organizations. And, you know, there are a lot of things in place that are currently in place and, and a lot of female um, female-funded organizations, female funding uh, mechanisms, uh, oriented mechanisms that are in place now that weren't in place, um, yeah. you know... <laughs> 10, 12 years ago. Um, but so I see it changing. And yes, it, there were times when I, uh, I was the only woman at the table at the boardroom or the only woman at the table at an investor meeting. And, you know, it can be a little intimidating, but, you know, I, I, I think all things are a matter of perspective. So what can be intimidating can also be my advantage, right? Like, so I am the only woman at the table. Yeah. So I'm the only voice that is unique and different in, in a very dramatic way. And so I use that as a, you know, sort of motivation for me to um, assert myself. Where, and, and I would also say that I never felt um, sort of maligned because I had my husband there and someone was listening to him um, or was willing to fund, willing to fund, you know, but like turn to them and it turned to him or my brother-in-law who was our CFO. And, uh, you know, cause God knows, I don't know a whole lot about finance. My, my expertise is sort of people and branding. So, um, you know, I, I was, if it takes, my brother-in-law and my husband to get us funded and us to perpetuate a female oriented consumer brand that I could use my voice in a whole different way. Okay. I'll use whatever asset I have. So I think it's, um, I think it's true that it's hard for women to get funded. And I was one of those women that I didn't care (laughs) if it took my husband and my brother-in-law to help us get funding. I was happy for that to happen. Yeah. And I think, what you said, like the, the gap is, is slowly closing, but it's still there. Mm-hmm. It's a reality, but it is slowly closing. But I think even like the advice to other females, it's more so being able to like switch, switch it all also, you know, like switch it being like, I am the only female, like that's a value. I can provide my value in the room right now as the only female. So I think that's something that 
you know, we can take away and, and implement. So. Well, and here's the other thing, because of that, you can then challenge your team and say, look, look around, like where we need to hire more diversity in our organization. Where can we start? And, you know, that when we hired a a senior VP of operations, the next three major senior hires he did, because we simply talked about it, we're all women. We had like a woman run our plant. We had a woman, a senior VP of of supply chain. We got, you know, we got, he went out and did it. Like, Incredible. So, you know, you just have to tell people what you want and they'll go do it. If they can find the talent and the talent's there. Yeah. And then the next step is not even having to tell them and then they do it. Right. It's already done. Right. So that's, I'm- but you first have to tell them. I think a yeah, lot of yeah. folks are not used to it. Just sort of maybe if I bring this back in the same way that I, as a kid, didn't realize I could go to college. These people, these guys are just used to doing it the way they do it until you tell them. They're like, oh, most people are like, oh, OK, sure. I didn't yeah. think about it. Yeah. They never yeah. notice that there's only one woman in the boardroom. They're getting it now. But, you know, it's. Yeah. But, but there's no reason not to speak it and not to ask for it. Definitely. I, I think that's very, very valuable advice for sure. So I'm wondering, so Angie's Boom Chicka Pop, it got, so it got acquired by Conagra Brands um, in 2017. So how was that process for you and really um, kind of giving it, 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 did you still view it as like my baby that I'm giving up or <laughs> yeah, like talk me through that process. And then also I'd love to know where is Angie today? What are you up to today? And um, what, what brings you that same joy that Angie's Boom Chicka Pop brings or brought? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the sale to Conagra was sort of the climax to a, you know, um, a, a journey of investor uh, participation. So um, we first took investors in private, small private equity out of Boston in a minority position. And when we did that, we understood that there would, they, you know, what they do is, is to, you know, add value and, and, and then, um, you know, a, a, get their appreciation out of, out of the business. And so we knew that they would sell. And at that point, that would have been 2014. And we thought, well, maybe a strategic buyer would buy us at that point. Um, but private equity came in again, a larger private equity company and bought the whole thing. And we reinvested and sat on the board. And so it meant that our whole team could stay together again throughout the, you know, the investment um, thesis that they had, which was always sort of three to five years before they turn a brand. Yeah. And um, so we knew we were probably going to be together another three years. But with that in mind, we knew that eventually it would sell. So, and we were transparent with our employees. We, we provided uh, granted equity shares uh, to our employees so that if our, if we had success, that our employees would have success. And um, so everyone was working. It wasn't a surprise when we sold to ConAgra, it was the celebration. And um, it was exciting because we had created the Angie's Boom Chicken Pop, which was a female oriented brand with a female voice that celebrate celebrated, um, you know, something a little different on the salty snack aisle than potato chips, you know, and, yeah. and sort of, or, or a kid's something. This was, I felt like equal representation of women on the salty snack shelf. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, in an empowering, positive way. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I would, was so excited when we had a large company like ConAgra that was interested in the brand, in the positioning, in the messaging to the consumer, and the, the consumer, you know, got it and loved it and loved the product. So it 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 was sort of like letting go of my baby that grew up and went off to a really good college. Okay, that's yeah. what. <laughs> that's what it felt like to me. So I was ready to sort of step away and let go. Um, I like that analogy. And. Yeah. And, and it will always be mine, right? It still has my name. It will still always be mine in in my head. Um, So, you know, I want it to be successful. I want it to, to thrive out there in the world and I'll do whatever I can to help in that way. Yeah. And then for you today, I know you're also involved in investing. So yeah, talk a bit about that. So today, so I stayed on with ConAgra for about two years as a consultant on the brand. And um, 
Uh, and during those two years was a transition. And I would just say that transitions for entrepreneurs aren't necessarily easy um, when there's, you know, in this way, because you're so busy and you're so used to going full force yes. that it took us a while to take a step back and say, okay, now what kind of purposeful things do we really want to do? And so what we did was we invested in some small brands. Um, we participated in a, in this uh, sort of endeavor to create um uh, a for-profit organization out of a nonprofit organization that funds community economic development in Nicaragua and they're selling cassava flour and, you know, their, their profit will go back to farmers and um, we've been, and they built a school and they built a hotel and they're educating people and building roads. And so we get to do some fun things like that and, and get to make investments in people. And yes. uh, we've been doing, We've doing, been doing some investments and mentoring and serving on some boards. I love it. I think that it's so great. I, I love to hear that. So, okay, Angie, for final two questions, <laughs> I have to ask. Here so, goes. So one, what's a passion or hobby that you have that's just unrelated to any of your work? I, I love to garden. I I love to get my hands in the dirt. I, I'm looking out my window right here, and I've got all kind of growing all kinds of weird foods, and, and I I I love it. I just love it. And it, it you know when our life was so busy and crazy, I didn't have time to garden because garden yeah. gardening takes a lot of a lot of effort and a lot of time. Yeah, I know. So um, during this time, I think a lot of people have taken up gardening. I think it's a meditative. It's a great it's a great space to go. So I love that. It's a great lesson too. Yeah. It's a really good lesson in life, right? Yeah. Okay. So final question, which by the mm -hmm. way, I've loved, loved this so much. So thank you for coming. Um, but final question is what's a talent? What's, what's your hidden talent? What's a talent, weird, fun talent that you have and no one really knows about. So I'm going to go first. Um, okay. So what I usually do is I throw blueberries and I catch them in my mouth. But for you, it's a special, special occasion. I'm going to try with with Angie's Boom Chicka Pop. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's see how this goes, okay? All right, Carly. Let's see it. Okay, so here we go. Okay. <laughs> this, could, this could really go one of two. Okay. Uh, oh, my God. Let's go. <laughs> Wow, that, that went well. I will say I practiced a few That's times good. before. I practiced a few times before just because blueberries is a little heavier, so it's all right. It worked right. Out. Yeah. All right. What's, what's your hidden time? That's exciting because I wasn't sure you were going to bring popcorn or blueberries. <laughs> I brought popcorn. I did it. Popcorn. My secret hidden talent, uh, and honestly, this is going to sound so gross. I can pick up things with my toes. <laughs> okay. That's not, I, what, what's the weirdest? Can you pick up anything? Is this like a... I can pick up peanuts. I can pick, <laughs> I can, I I can pick up trash with my toes. I love put it in the trash can. Yeah, right. I think I think that's a that's a great talent. I think it comes in handy often. So well done. Well cool. <laughs> <laughs> Well Angie, I wanna say thank you again. You've taught me so much. I'm excited for others to see and just learn from you. So really thank you so much for coming. Well thank you for having me, Carly. Good luck. Of course. Thank you so much for listening to the show this week. If you enjoyed, please spread the word. Tell someone about She Leads or post about it on social media and tag us. If you want to contact us, feel free to send over a message through the She Leads Instagram page at sheleads.show. If you want to follow us on Twitter, our account is at sheleadsshow and mine is at Carly Malatsky. This episode was produced and edited by Nick Fershow. Thank you also to our partner, Floodgate. If you're passionate about startups and want to learn more about the starting journey of those who have built groundbreaking companies, I highly recommend listening to Starting Greatness with Mike Maples Jr., the founding partner of Floodgate. He has an incredible show that, in my opinion, is definitely worth your time. Thanks again.